Hey everyone, welcome to the August version of the Windows in the Cloud Ask Microsoft Anything. Thanks for joining us wherever you are in the world, just like you can your cloud PC, but also your Azure Virtual Desktop VM. If you joined us last month, you noticed that uh, Colby mentioned that we are now introducing Azure Virtual Desktop um, as part of our beloved cloud products. So we will be spending time both with Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop. And today, we are going to be spending time on Azure Virtual Desktop. So uh, for the very first instance of this, thanks for joining. Um, I'm your uh, typical host, Christian Montoya, uh, product manager on the Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop team, I'm working on all the protocol and making sure your connections are awesome. Um, so I'm going to go around the horn here. Um, I'll start with you, Eric. Uh, I think you're you're a little familiar, but please reintroduce yourself. Hey, I'm Eric Orman. I've been around these VDI realms for quite a while, uh, working on various products or enterprise management. Um, and I'm a PM lead on the Windows Cloud Experiencing Windows Cloud Experience team. I primarily focus on Azure Virtual Desktop these days, uh, which also includes FS Logics and Remote Desktop Services, uh, the classic um, service of RDPing with, that is found in Windows Server is an area that I own also. Perfect. Thanks, Eric. And uh, Ian? Yeah, thanks, Christian. Uh, hi, everybody. Ian Warren. Been at Microsoft for eight years now, and time's flown. I work also in the Windows Cloud Experiences team um, within the CAT team, the Customer Acceleration team. So very much talking to customers, learning how we can improve AVD. Perfect. Good. And then Jason? Yeah, thanks, Christian. I'm Jason Parker. I'm the uh, product manager for FS Logics. I've been at Microsoft 11 years. I'm new to the product team as about 18 months ago. Uh, spent a uh, majority of my career at Microsoft in the services and consulting, so bring a lot of uh, end user and customer experience. So just looking forward to uh, chat with everybody today. Awesome. Yeah, thank thank you all for joining. And we actually have a, a really geographic spread today. Um, no same, no no two people in the same state. So this is our country. I guess some of us in the same country. But anyways, great crew today. I'm really excited to have you all on. Um, just for some just for some starters, um, I know if you've joined in previous months, we mentioned what's new in the product. Um, this is our first <laughs> Azure Virtual Desktop uh, AMA, so there's probably a lot that's new since we last met. Um, but to start off, I want to add some, some key highlights uh, of things that uh, hopefully you can go check out um, and, and, and test out yourself. Uh, one of them is the custom image template um, that's in public preview. Um, it's been in public preview, um, but we are really excited about it. it makes it really easy to uh, deploy your session host and host pools. Um, so go check out that uh, MS link. And if you have any questions, obviously post here. Um, and then also, uh, Jason, I think you're really excited about it. The FS Logix 2210 Hotfix 2 went live. Was that yesterday? Absolutely. Yeah, we went live yesterday and uh, gotten a lot of good feedback on this, addressing some of the top issues customers have had with Cloud Cache in particular, but also addressing some of the issues we've had with uh, unexpected reboots. Uh, and there's also some significant updates to the group policy templates. So get in there and check it out. Perfect. Yeah. And, if, and again, if you have a qu any questions, uh, let's ask here. Let's uh, see if we can get those answers for you. Uh, so... Uh, we, you know, those are just the, the top two highlights. Um, we always have our, our what's new uh, pages uh, for, for any release that we have um, month over month or, you know, those one-off releases. Um, and then uh, we're, you know, in the full swing of it. Um, you know, everyone, <laughs> everyone's on vacation, but everyone's coming back too. So uh, we're ready to continue delivering awesome stuff for uh, Azure Virtual Desktop. Um, let's see if we have any questions that came in. So one of the questions is, can someone please explain the difference between RDP short path and private link and the scenarios where each of these should be used? Sure, Christian, I can, I can pick this one up. Uh, we get asked this quite often, actually, um, a bit of confusion as to what, what each of the technologies does and where we can place it. So they are quite different. So RDP short path is primarily focused on connection quality. OK, it's to ensure that we are able to reduce round trip times. Uh, so an example from, say, some of the customers that I'm working with and seeing is users connected in from maybe India 
the virtual machines not located within the India region, they may be located within America or in the UK regions. So the user experience is suboptimal, okay? There's quite a distance between those regions uh, and the traditional TCP connectivity going over the gateway can be improved using IDP short path. You can actually use a VPN connection or an express route circuit to be able to use a UDP connection to connect directly to the connection host. That reduces latency and therefore gives you a far better user experience. The use cases for private link again are quite different. What this is primarily used for is connection security. Okay, so this is for customers such as financial services organizations that want to steer their um, AVD traffic away from the internet. They want to make sure that the connectivity is going over a private link connection. Okay, so the session host traffic goes over the Azure backbone and the client traffic is going over, again, a VPN or an express route circuit. Uh, so it's, it's using a private link connection to be able to maximize the security of, of that uh, scenario. And, and Ian, on that one, um, I feel like we've also, I, I've also heard this question a little bit. Is there a, um, a use case where you would actually use kind of both them together? where you set up the private link on the objects themselves and then the connection is, you know, you're still trying to use short path, which is all the UDP and whatnot. Yeah, we get, we get asked this. Now, we get asked it and we are currently um, gathering evidence, shall we say, to understand the, the demand for this. It isn't currently supported to be able to use private link in conjunction with IDP short path. So you would tend to use one or the other, but yeah, absolutely. That's a good question, Christian. Perfect. Yeah, and uh, yeah, my I have some awesome folks on my team working on Short Path, making sure uh, that it goes out on on even more platforms. Because uh, right now it's on the uh, the Windows Desktop client um, or the Azure Virtual Desktop Store client, um, and so we're trying to make sure that it gets to all the clients. So no matter where you're connecting, um, you can uh, get those benefits and have that really awesome connection. But yeah, thank you, Ian. Thank you. Uh, let's see from uh, from Osman. I'm testing AVD watermarking and screen capture protection on Windows 365 Cloud PCs. We've made MFA mandatory for users. Um, I, I don't, however, see an option to use MFA and with watermarking and screen capture protection. Um, is there a point that I have overlooked about this issue? What method should I follow? Um, anyone here have guidance? I th it sounds like the question is, is there some way to uh, tie the feature itself with the, well, Azure, formerly Azure ID, now uh, Microsoft Intra. Entra ID. Or is it Entra or Entra mm -hmm. ID? <laughs> it's, well, there, there, it's Entra, and then there's uh, Entra ID. Got it. Yeah, I guess the, the question is if Entra. we can on, on <laughs> combine it with uh the watermarking screen capture protection feature um from what i know i, I don't think there's a way to do it because that's mostly a, a feature of the connection and it's really just mm -hmm. the connection or the service all up that can trigger the mfa i don't know if you'll have any other thoughts no i mean we'll have to go back and double check but i'm pretty sure the you know screen protection watermarking is a feature from the avd service whereas mfa is part of the identity so you know, we don't typically tie those two things together because your identity can have several different iterations of what that may look like. And so we just offer the screen protection and watermarking as um, a standalone feature for AVD. Okay, yeah, that's, that, that's, that makes sense. That's kind of what I was thinking too. Um, but we can, Osmond, um, we can go back. It uh, looks like, oh, I think there's more uh, information here. Um, there's also another post or another question. I think it's related to this. Um, MFA does not support the Windows desktop app connections, um, remote desktop, which are the remote desktop client, Azure Virtual Desktop Preview, and Windows 365 app for the Windows 365 Cloud PCs and watermarking and screen capture protection do not support the web browser connections. Um, so MFA, you can get on any platform. Um, you can trigger on any platform. Um, the conditional access uh, feature in in Microsoft Entra, Entra, <laughs> pretty powerful. Um, you can you can really control who, when, and um, you know how how often folks are uh, 
challenge with MFA. So um, you definitely can do it on the Windows desktop connections. Um, there might just be settings on if your device is managed by the same organization. So if you're, uh, you know, joined to the same organization, then you're going to get a device token and it's that's going to keep refreshing the background. So you may not get as many MFA prompts. Um, so it's still supported. Um, there just might be, it just depends on how your uh, devices are joined. Um, I wonder I if there's a, a, I'm sorry, Christian. I wonder if there's an opportunity here where maybe we take some customer feedback, right? And say, is it, do we want to have some integration with policy driven uh, items for identity, you know, translate into the AVD service? Is that something that customers are looking to do? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, so Osman or, or, you know, anyone listening, um, are there specific, yeah, what you said, Jason, uh, connection you restate settings? That? Yeah, like connection settings or other, po- or other things that are within the Azure Virtual Desktop service that you want the extra verification that you want to trigger additional MFA or, or checks? If so, that sounds like a, you know, we will, that sounds like good feedback for us. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, yeah, thanks for that suggestion, Jason. Um, Eric, is there anything on the horizon on that? Do you know, <laughs> since you're also working on ABD? <laughs> no, um, nothing on that. Um, just, I guess, the watermarking and screen capture, those are settings that you apply on the host. They're not uh, conditional access settings. So I think that might be one nuance that was missed in that discussion and description. So if you want to do watermarking and screen capture, uh, you, you know, group policies are the ways in order to set those um, MFA, and, and those are conditional access policies that are configured in Entre ID. Um, so they're, they're, they're completely separate of each other. Yeah. Just on that point, Eric, actually, as well, we talked about custom image templates as well. You can enable screen capture protection within custom image templates as well. So that's a pretty cool feature. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Yeah. The, yeah, quick, quick uh, word on the custom image templates. How many plugins are, are there on that? There's so many awesome ones. Like there is also the language one. Now, there's a screen capture. Is not there also FS Logics on there, Jason? How how many yep. are there? <laughs> That's a great question. I think we'll uh, uh, we need to get some information from Ava, who uh, is running that uh, these days. But um, yeah, there's a lot of great plugins for custom image templates, giving admins and customers the ability to, to really uh, get their images fine tuned and dialed in for what they're looking for. There is. I, I took a screenshot actually of the uh, of the built-in scripts beforehand, so I have them listed here. And some of the ones that I'm seeing customers use is 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 uh, I think like language packs. Okay, being able to install language packs and also set the default um, uh, OS language as well is really cool. Uh, so being able to do that, being able to think like RDP short path, uh, being able to take away some of the Apex or Windows inbox applications as well from the default Windows image. Um, being able to force um, and apply Windows updates. So there's there's a bunch of things and they're growing since private preview we've seen customer feedback um, and some of these features are growing, um, you know, being able to set the, the team's optimizations, but also the version of the WebRTC redirect, redirect service as well. So yeah, some really cool stuff coming out there. Yeah, this is, that is an awesome feature. So I'm really excited. It's getting traction. It's still, uh, we're getting awesome feedback in public preview. Um, oh, so actually, um, not quite the WebRTC redirection, but um, a related question. As an IT admin, I would like to be able to control the AVD client updates across my endpoints. Can I block the client updates to allow me to test them before I roll them out into production? Yes, yeah, so I've seen this question raised before, actually, Christian, and it's an interesting one. <clears throat> Technically, you can, and we document this within the AVD docs. So you can block them if you wanted to. However, we wouldn't recommend doing it, to be honest with you. You know, there's a, there has to be a real key use case for doing so. We, when we release the AVD client, it goes through a period of regression testing. Obviously, we have the insider build, which is pushed out. So we encourage you to always go away and test that, first of all, within a, um, you know, a, maybe a smaller group, within a smaller ring. But the clients itself, they include a bunch of, you know, client diagnostic improvements, maybe fixing bugs, um, performance improvements, and so on. So we would always recommend that customers use the latest version of the AVD client. Um, in actual fact, if you did ever encounter an issue with AVD connectivity and the client, 
our support teams would always ask that you deploy the latest version of AVD client. So technically, yes, you can actually prevent the client from being installed, but we, we really wouldn't recommend it to be honest. Yeah, just to just to to dig into that, you you mentioned that there's a way to do the insiders. Um, do you what what were the steps? Do you know what the steps are for that um, to get the kind of the validation, the earlier bits? Yeah, again, it is documented within the AVD docs. You can set a registry key uh, that will allow you to be able to get the the insider build. Um, again, you can download it also from our. Uh, our docs, our client side of the documentation to be able to use that, do your testing in there. And then obviously we flip it over to being a, a, um, a production version of the um, or generally, available, generally available release of the client um, once it's been fully tested. Yeah. I think that's a good point though, you know, and it's similar to FS Logics, right? Where we develop a client and we're constantly iterating on that client and that software, and we're, we're providing the best and most up-to-date features and security fixes on those clients going forward. And, and similar with the AVD client and our all of our Windows clients, we don't go back and add functionality or fixes to those older versions. So the best way to stay secure and up-to-date is to be on the latest version. And FS Logics does the same thing. We, we operate from the latest version, the best way to be up to date and to be supported is to be on that latest version. Uh, and we have ways and mechanisms to, you know, test those things early, whether it's through an early access program or things like that, that you can kind of run through before you fully commit it into your production environment. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and then just on that, the registry key for keeping or for kind of opting in uh, for that insiders build, um, that is on the um, the device that's connecting, um, which makes sense because that's where the, <laughs> that's where you're going to launch the client. Um, so uh, we know that some folks uh, use BY uh, have run in the BYOD scenario, bring your own device. Um, so you may not be able to kind of push that to target audiences. It may have to be an opt-in system where you you have specific users that are really active and really want to give feedback, and they kind of have to opt in and do it. So. Just be aware of that, um, just as you're considering uh, early validation. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's see. Here's a, a good question, um, a good general one. So um, sizing, correct, the, sizing the correct session host um, in Azure Virtual Desktop can take a significant amount of time and effort. Do you have any recommendations on how we can accelerate the sizing? Uh, I guess accelerate the the sizing, the, the validation of session hosts. Sure, um, I can t I can take this one. So again, it get asked, we get asked this quite a lot. You know, we we want to deploy AVD. What size VMs do we should we be using? You know, what's what's the right size? And it's it's a difficult question to answer. It all depends on. How many applications you're using? Are you using personal or multi-session desktops? Um, so let's assume that the question is based on multi-session. And so ideally what you want to be able to do is look at your historic data or maybe your existing VDI platform if you have one. It might be that you're migrating away from another platform, in which case you have a good understanding of what the uh, VM performance should look like. What is the processor type? What is the processor size? How many calls does it have? How much RAM does it have? What's the size of the disk? All information should be available to you to help accelerate and understand what the target environment should look like. If you don't have that, then you know, you've got a couple of options, I guess. You can invest in third-party tool sets, so the likes of uh, Login BSI um, or, or, or Lakeside, for example. They do uh, very purpose um, built types of tool sets that allow you to be able to do analysis on your workloads to be able to optimize those for an AVD environment. <clears throat> if you don't have those tool sets, then you could just go through the process of looking at the metrics on the VMs that you have today. So you can enable, again, the performance counters, you can look at those and then determine whether you need to go up a SKU size, a VM size, or alternative, what you could do is change that slightly and say, well, actually, let's limit the number of users that we have um, using the uh, max session limit count. So we can only maybe have 10 users on that box. And then that way, you're going to make sure that you have a guaranteed level of performance 
rather than a situation where we may have 10 on one box, 15 on the other, and that 15 uses it having an impact on performance. So there are a number of things that you can do there. We also have within our docs recommendations and sizing kind of guidelines as well, and depending on the type of workload and type of user that you uh, have within your organization. Yeah, that's great information, Ian. I think that when I was helping customers, you know, in sizing AVD, you, you know, we offer some initial recommendations, like you said, and we have partners that have tools, um, but we make it pretty easy with inside the the AVD platform where you can uh, adjust the number of users per uh, session host. And a good rule of thumb, like when you're just kind of testing things out, is is map one user per virtual CPU and stack up those boxes and build your test environment where you're putting users in depth or you're stacking more users at a time on a single machine and do have them run day-to-day -day operations. And if you can, and then as you start seeing the performance not have an impact for those users, you can then look at stacking. Maybe we want, you know, one and a half users per virtual CPU, maybe two users per virtual CPU. And you get a lot of flexibility. And that's kind of the benefit of having the cloud platform is you kind of get this uh, easy to scale and test out these different scenarios to make it really custom tailored to you. Yeah, that's a good point, Jason. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting concept because you just said uh, that one way to kind of get that usage, get those metrics is by doing the depth, you know, putting users on a single uh, session host before it starts the next one. Uh, I guess in my head, that almost maps out to while you're validating how many users are on a box, maybe start with depth because that's going to get you the right sizing. But then once you figure out your number, does it make sense mm -hmm. to go to breadth? That way the users just, let's Absolutely. say you have 80 users across 10 boxes. If you do breadth, then for a little bit, they might get the best performance of their lives. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's yeah. a number of different ways. Like Again, you can mix and match these different processes and policies within different host pools. And like you said, stacking to get you know sizing understood and then moving into breadth where you can start scaling across your environment. And that way you've got a more predictable load, you know, and we know is, you know, within classic VDI infrastructure and an AVD, we have customers that have users that log in at the same time every day. And we see those kind of peak loads. So understanding your peak load also, because login time and the performance of the VM is very different than sustained performance, right? So when the user's in there, they got their applications already loaded versus, hey, I'm logging in for the very first time. So those things are very different. You got to kind of understand both metrics. And we've got great things like uh, host pool, uh, session host scaling, and we've, you know, that's, that's all automated. Uh, you've got start VM on connect, so you can have those VMs already turned off and then start them up as you need to. So a lot of great features to help you start small and then scale up as you need to. That's a good point, Jason. That's a new release as well, which went into public preview for personal pills, um, was the uh, the ability of being able to scale, uh, to switch them off effectively. So um, using um, scaling plans. So being able to say, okay, my personal desktop isn't in use now. It hasn't been used for maybe 15, 20 minutes. It'll then go on to deallocate itself, which we are seeing uh, within customers that I'm working with that have a significant impact on cost. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really good highlight because um, as we all know, with um, with multi enterprise multi-session, again, yeah, you can stack however many users that you size it for. But yeah, personal desktops, it's you're running probably at least two vCPUs or four CPUs, and that's going to be per user. So yeah, those costs add up. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes, so yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, well, when was it? Was it last month? Um, I forget when, if it was last month or the month before that, yeah, the support, the uh, the scaling plans for personal desktops uh, went live. Yeah, previous to that, I was working with customers that were creating their own scripts. And I was looking earlier at some of the tech community stuff on there that's, um, that's out there. And I think, again, there was, there was some scripts and some um, various ways of being able to achieve this back in, in about 2021. So, I mean, it's, you know, customers have been struggling with this and, you know, we're taking that feedback and now we release this personal desktop scaling. It's um, it, it's going to be really popular. Looks like we have another question from Twitter. We use app V today. However, it will no longer be supported from April, 2026. What advice do you have for those who want to plan their application deployment strategy over the next three years? 
Eric's got his hand up. Go for it. <laughs> I'll take it. And, I'll, and I'll just throw a, um, a nugget out there. I wish Jim Moyle, who's on my team, uh, who focuses on app attach and also host pool uh, provisioning, was here to answer this question because he'll go into great detail. But to answer the question in a little uh, kind of lighter way, um, yes, AppV is depre being deprecated uh, in 2026. We are encouraging customers to move to MSIX AppAttach. Uh, so what that would mean for you is uh, your existing AppV applications would need to be converted to the MSIX format. Uh, there are some PowerShell scripts out there uh, in a very robust community uh, of help and assistance through the Microsoft page. Um, that'll walk you through how to convert your AppV applications to MSI Act, App, MSIX app attach. But that's only part one. Part two is then you need to expand that package into a VHD format to use. Uh, and that's where we call the app attach part of it. So uh, first you need to convert it from AppV to MSIX, and then you need to do the app attach expansion of it, which is another PowerShell script. So um, there's lots of resources out there um, in order to help you out with those. But um, we have integration right within AVD. There's some new stuff coming. Um, I, I, we currently have it in a preview. Um, and so you'll start to see some really uh, nicer integration with AppAttach coming you know, within the next few months. But I hope that answered the bulk of your question. Um, and I'll queue up Ignite uh, is in the coming months. And that's always a great place where a lot of cool things get announced and previewed. And so mark that on your calendar. Yeah. Do we have the, the dates for Ignite? I don't remember if we've, if my, I believe it's the 15th it and the 16th of November, but I can, I could double check. It's, it's mid November. Okay. Yeah. I know we always have some goodies, some, 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 uh, fun announcements. Um, and, uh, yeah, so definitely looking forward to seeing you there. Looks like we've got another question from Twitter that's right in my wheelhouse. So I'll go ahead and, and ask this. Perfect. We're trying to use FS Logics, but can't use Azure Virtual Desktop. Can the profiles be stored on prem? Our environment primarily uses physical desktops with VMs, pretty much only used as servers. Great question. Um, FS Logics, while it is a main component that facilitates Azure Virtual Desktop, its roots actually come from longstanding VDI infrastructure prior to AVD. And uh, you know, FS Logics as a as a product, we have you know a large portion of our customers are out, are still on prem or in other you know environments, whether it's Citrix, VMware, uh, RDS. So. FS Logics can be utilized across, you know, your on-prem environment, your eight Azure Virtual Desktop, uh, Citrix Cloud in Azure, VMware Horizon in Azure. There's a lot of opportunities to use FS Logics. Uh, the only only stipulation is that we do have eligibility requirements to use the product, which is part of your Microsoft um, um, 365 licensing. So, um, and caveats for using multi-session windows are going to be uh, primarily only in Azure Virtual Desktop. So if you got VMs like server, server 2019, 2022, uh, they're all running on-prem, you can load uh, FS Logics on there, set your file shares to uh, local on-prem SMB file shares, uh, and you'll be good to go. Yeah, I, I forgot that we had that flexibility for customers. So that's really cool. Um, let's see. Oh, so another question uh, from Harun is, uh, lately users have been getting a blank or black sign-in screen a lot while connecting to AVD. Any idea what typically causes this issue and what is the permanent fix? So I'll I'll take this one. Uh, we do see this a lot with customers that you know are are logging into AVD and they're monitoring their login times and seeing black screen. Uh, typically black screen, you're going to get two, you know, during a connection stream, you're going to have an initial black screen, then you'll have the windows loading, uh, you know, the login services, FS logic services, we're loading your profile, then another black screen. And that, that time is typically uh, bound by your group policies that are applying as well as app readiness service. Uh, the app readiness service is making sure that all of your uh, applications are kind of getting from an AppX package standpoint, you're getting ready you know, and set up for the user. 
Um, so if you're seeing black screen issues, that it is a very common scenario. Um, the length of time and duration of that is dependent upon the applications that the customer or the end user has. Um, so I, I would say there's not really a permanent fix for black screen, um, at least from a, you know, from a login time, especially as an FS logics profile, you know, if we, we've gone with a lot of different customers and done deep dive analysis on their login sequence and looking at the logs and all the tracing and, you know, from the profile loading perspective, that's happening very quickly in, in magnitudes of, you know, three to six seconds, depending upon your configuration. Um, and then we're just kind of waiting for the window shell and app readiness to kind of get all those other components ready to go. Yeah. And I'm also curious and maybe Haroon, if you're still, um, on the tech community or wherever you post the question, um, I'm really curious on if it was that temporary state, you know, as the connection is being started, um, especially if you have a lot of yeah, if you have FS logics and everything running, um, or if you're talking about, um, you know, a black screen where a user connects and it just never gets past that, and it's and it's more or less like a hung black screen. Because mm -hmm. um, if it's if it's one if it's the latter, if it's just like you never actually get connected, um, then we definitely I uh, want you to raise a support ticket. Um, that way we can take a look at it. Um, Cause that's, you know, we want to make sure we, we solve that. Um, so I feel like that's, that's the main guidance I'd have there. Um, and I think then you I bring up a good point, Christian. Like the, we see a lot of uh, questions that pop up on tech community or on social media and support cases are probably the best way for you to, you know, get your voice heard because, you know, as a product team, we're deeply involved with the support team. And as issues come in, we're looking at those issues and especially ones that are complicated that we don't have a good answer to. We're looking for those complicated issues because our environments and the way that we test product can't possibly encompass every possible scenario that our customers are, are sitting in. So we really need that firsthand knowledge and customers that are willing to, you know, and I'll, I'll admit it, it is a bit of work, right? You have to spend the time, you have to gather data, you have to go through those initial triage steps, but all those things are critically important for us as a product team to understand what's unique about your environment and how do we best understand the things that are affecting your environment so we can either adjust the product or, you know, look at another direction to say, well, we've seen this in other in other cases, and this has been the common factor that's outside of either ABD, Windows Multi Session, FS Logics, and we can kind of get those those right um, troubleshooting steps. Yeah, and then for everyone listening, um, yeah, what what Jason mentioned is 100 percent correct. Like we definitely focus on support cases because, um, yeah, it those are environments that that are probably more complex than we could ever test. Um, we also we want to make sure that you're actually enjoying the product. So if you have a lot of support cases, then uh, <laughs> then obviously you're probably not. Um, and then also um, it is just a direct you know direct line uh, communication because you'll get a you know a support uh, case person. And then um, if there's if any anything does need to escalate further, then you know we we work with you. So yeah, if if you have anything that's not working as expected, um, you know don't hesitate. Um, because then, you know, we we do have. Ooh, OK, so I looked at the next question already, so I'm already really excited. <laughs> From LinkedIn, ABD newbie here, still learning. Is it a best practice to join the ABD host to the domain and control applications via system context and user settings on multi-session ABD hosts from Intune? Any good guides out there on how to set this up and what to control from Intune? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. I was like, I, either should I start? Should Eric start? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, Intune is supported on uh, both the Windows 10 and Windows 11 client multi-session um, images or SKUs. So um, the, the tricky part of it is um, how you do that Intune enrollment. So if you're, if you're planning to do Azure AD join, or sorry, Entra ID join, still really can't figure that out because you used to say, AADJ, and now it's come E. <laughs> I e I don't bother. Don't bother. <laughs> A E I O U. It's I don't okay. know. Um, so <laughs> when you Azure join or Entra 
AD join. It, it's just easy. If you have Intune configured to auto enroll, um, your host, your AVD host will automatically enroll if their Entra ID joined. If you choose the option to AD join, um, then you have to configure hybrid Azure AD join or what's the new one? Hybrid Entra ID join. Uh, but basically what that is, uh, it's nowhere in the Azure portal. It's nowhere in um, Intune. You as part of your AD Connect tool that synchronizes your users and devices from your on-premise domain uh, up into Entra ID. Um, within that, there is a workflow to enable hybrid Azure AD join and make sure you select the right OUs uh, in that. Um, and so basically uh, any OUs you select to synchronize users, you can go back and select similar OUs and it'll synchronize the devices. Um, so that's key uh, is that you enable that hybrid join in your AD connector. The other half is when you create your AVD host pool, the OU that you speci specified, make sure that one is enabled in AD to hybrid Azure AD join. So that's that's super key um, because if you don't, then those endpoints are not going to be hybrid Azure AD join. Entre, I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> uh, and then the GPO that you'll deploy, uh, group policy object, um, is available uh, to do the automatic enrollment. So you would target that GPO, uh, that MDM enrollment GPO to that same OU um, that you selected in your host pool, uh, which also is configured to do hybrid Azure AD join. And you wanna make sure that you do the device credential, uh, not the user credential when you target that OU to do the enrollment. If you do the user credential, um, the Intune enrollment won't happen until the user logs on to the host. Uh, and if there's MFA, there's just delays. But if you use the device credential, uh, it, the process is rather quick. Um, host pool will create the hosts, uh, the hybrid Azure AD join within a few minutes. Uh, and then after they complete the hybrid join, then they'll Intune enroll. So, you know, depending upon your Azure AD Connect sync cycle, the default is 30 minutes. Uh, if you haven't changed that, that whole kind of process takes right around an hour. So uh, create your host pool, um, go take a walk around the neighborhood, a long cup of coffee, binge watch two episodes of your favorite 30 minute show, uh, come back and it should be ready for that. And so that gets your endpoints into and enrolled. Now, um, multi-session management uh, via Intune, not all features and capabilities of Intune are applicable. So there's certain things that you never want to do, like Windows updates on your multi-session host. That's probably the single biggest one that I'll say. Um, but you do want Defender updates to happen on those. But you don't want to be doing live patching of your hosts um, with Windows updates because they're going to deviate. Um, you know, maybe you know, however you specified in your host pool configuration of how many hosts to create. If you created five of them and your Windows update, they might get out of sync. Uh, and that causes problems. Um, so users go to log on and one is at a different version. Uh, and then later in the day, they connect to host number four. They're going to be at a, maybe a different version. And so you want your host all to be identical because they're simply just clones of each other. So live patching using Windows Update for Business is not there. Uh, don't do that. What you would do instead is host pool update. And we have some really cool features. Again, I wish Jim was here to talk about host pool update. Um, and that process for it. You would want to update your image for Windows updates. And, and same goes for um, like apps. Uh, you don't want to be deploying live applications or you don't want to be deploying applications to your, your, your host using Intune at all easy, either. You, you want to update your custom image and then do a host pool update process for that. Mm -hmm. um, settings and configurations are, uh, apply pretty quickly. Uh, and they're not drastic changes. So those are all supported, like settings catalog and templates within Intune. Those are great resources, uh, not resources, but um, feature sets to use within Intune. Mm -hmm. and so I hope I answered kind of in a very robust way um, some of the like enrollment piece of it, which usually just trip up a lot of people, uh, and then also just some of the features and capabilities. I, I feel like the, the general answer is it depends, <laughs> especially with ABD, because you yes. control so many knobs, right? Um, I just I, actually, Eric, I want to ask you this question. So we've been talking about the difference between the, um, you know, having session hosts, so the multi-session versus personal desktops where you would run 
just Windows 10 or 11 Enterprise. So my question is, um, and you know, for the LinkedIn post, if you already have policies and settings for physical machines and you're deploying personal desktops essentially as a one-to-one replacement, is that a good one to kind of use Intune for essentially extend those same policy settings to the Intune managed uh, AVD personal desktops or a hundred percent. Yeah. Because it's windows 10 or windows 11 enterprise that's running. It's the same version of windows that I'm running on my desktop and my surface laptop over here. So all the same configurations and policies uh, apply to it. Um, the applications are going to run the same. So whether you're doing Windows 365, which is Windows 10 or Windows 11 Enterprise, or you have an AVD personal desktop deployment that's using Windows 10 or Windows 11 Enterprise, the application's the same. Or And then your physical running Windows 10, Windows 11 Enterprise. It's all applicable. Um, there are some nuances uh, and some superpowers that both AVD and Windows 365 provide over a physical device, um, but those are kind of nuanced. Um, the big thing is to your question, Christian, is yes, all of those same settings. So aligning your methodology for all the settings and configurations you apply to your physical devices are applicable to also cloud PCs and Windows 365 and AVD hosts for personal desktop AVD hosts. Yeah, and just to add to that, I have um, customers that I'm working with that obviously have uh, large physical desktop estates rolling out personal desktops and AVD, and they're using Config Manager again to handle some of the configuration um, aspects. Just an extension of your of your current uh, physical estate. Yeah, yeah, CoManage is totally supported on those both Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop personal desktop. Um, the, the same flows of co-management and rolling. A physical device applies to an AVD personal desktop. And also, well, Config Manager is also supported on the multi-session also. So the same processes for co-management enrollment on those are applicable also. Awesome. Let's go to the next question, which I already pre-read, and I'm excited for this one. Uh, <laughs> this is from Brian. We are using Windows multi-session images, Windows multi-session plus Microsoft 365 apps, example of Windows 11 22H2 from the marketplace, but it contains an old version of FS Logix, which is 2201 Hotfix 1, which contains all sorts of bugs and issues. Why does the image not contain the newest version of FS Logix? That is a great question. Um, and if you go out to the FS Logix blog, um, you'll see a post that I recently made where we talk about uh, a new process that we started uh, many, many months ago to ensure that the marketplace images have the latest version of FS Logix. And it was actually quite a long process, um, to be honest. And, you know, coming into the product team, it felt a little uh, strange that the product wasn't easily integrated every month. And so we spent some time as an engineering team and worked with the Windows team and really built a process around ensuring that uh, as we when we had a new version, that the Windows team was able to pick it up, build it into their image base and deploy it to the marketplace. So as of last week, um, and and there's a little bit of a snafu here and you'll see in, in the uh, 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 in the FS Logics news uh, article uh, that we've got uh, for the 2210 Hotfix 2 release, we had some images deploy with our latest GA release, and then some images that deployed with the the previous release. So we do have a little bit of a mismatch here. Um, that was just uh, some last minute changes that happened. So I do apologize for for that that confusion. But going forward, what you can anticipate is that on Patch Tuesday of every month. Uh, Whenever Windows deploys their new marketplace images, if there is a new version of FS Logics available, it will be automatically integrated in, into every multi-session image, which also means that the FS Logics released schedule will now coincide on Patch Tuesday. So um, we are planning sometime next year for another full feature release, and that full feature release next year will fall on a Patch Tuesday so that you'll get the release to the public. It'll be in the marketplace images, and it'll all fall on the same day, and everybody can have it on all their images. So great question, um, and a, a lot of great work by the Windows team uh, and our, our FS Logics engineering team. That's awesome. 
I love getting everything aligned to a regular cadence. Everyone can understand. Um, that's that's awesome, Jason. Good to hear. Um, okay, so we have a question from Elliot. I was able to get URI, URI schemes to work with the remote desktop client, but it defaults to full screen using all monitors. Do you have any tips on customizing this to full screen on one monitor? Um, I feel like this, the answer to this is is interesting because, uh, if you're if you're an AVD admin and, and publishing the feed desktops apps to users, um, it sounds like you have a very specific set of use uh, like workers, employees in mind where they're only going to have one desktop. Or sorry, one monitor, or you only want them to have one monitor because they're in a dual monitor setup and they have to do stuff on local, etc. Um, if that's the case, then there you can use uh, custom RDP properties in the the host pool settings. Um, most, of the, I believe, most of the drop downs, most most of the the ones we've highlighted are more connection security and uh, redirections. But there are still the uh, the RDP properties for display. Um, and so there's ones like use multi monitors. Um, you, it's like, I think use multi mod I for integer and then zero or one. Um, so you can turn that to zero. And then there's, there was another setting. I forgot the name of it. Um, that says full screen or not. Um, and so all of those are in our docs. Um, there's a full list of the RDP properties that you can, that you can use. Um, so yeah, if you're very specifically uh, providing these the desktop or apps to specific users that you you know you want this configuration configuration to happen, you can do it in the host pool settings and there to be properties. But other than that, it's I've always found it a little tricky to to set a default for users. Um, they can still change on their client, um, mm -hmm. but I've always found that tricky. I don't know if others have thoughts. I think this is a part of like maybe user education as well, like user training. If you're onboarding users into, you know, VDI or, or Azure virtual desktop, you know, having some education around, well, here's the client, here's some different settings, having good help docs for them so they can know, you know, when they have their own environment, maybe they've got three monitors, maybe they've got two monitors, you know, that they can adjust these settings to do that. But like Christian said, a lot of the RDB properties provide a variety of settings. You can even do things like forcing screen resolution size. Um, so all those things are, are available. Um, is there somebody that maybe I, I'm unfamiliar with URI schemes? Um, does anybody have yeah. any information on that? I know the level, I would, wouldn't even say level 100. I know level 50, <laughs> <laughs> what URI schemes are. Cause I know that a lot of, on a lot of apps, you can publish just metadata um, into the registry. Um, and then that will help dictate some of the client information, um, way back when I think we had your I schemes, um, that helped with the start menu integration or it's, mm. you know, it was like default feed Like you can basically, um, I think it's for RDS. Um, you can basically put in, um, registry. If you manage that device where you should point to automatically, um, when you load, um, when you're, when you're doing the from the start menu integration for RDS. So anyways, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what they mean. But actually, Jason, I want to go back. You had a really good point, and I had not thought about it. Um, yes, users can change the settings. Um, I know it's it's a little bit hidden on on uh, some of the clients. Um, like on the, on the Windows, on Windows with the Azure Virtual Desktop Store client or the, um, the Windows Desktop client, you can right-click on... Um, at least I know for sure on the desktops, you can right click um, on the session desktop icon, um, go to settings. There, it'll basically have a toggle that says default settings on and it defaults to true. But then if you turn that off, you can actually really configure your monitors, almost like you can do in system settings where you could select, okay, it shows your monitor setup. You can click, you know, I want it on one, two, and three, or I only want it on one and two. Um, but that's a good point. Um, like you said, for AVD, for AVD admins that that like to publish uh, information um, to their users, um, if for a, a setup guide for troubleshooting, um, we we do have client information uh, information on how to use the clients on our docs as well. Um, so you can use all that content to kind of build your own instruction set for your users. 
Yeah, just to add there, Christy, it's important to note the RDP properties are set at the host pool level. Therefore, mm -hmm. right. it affects everybody connecting to that host pool. Um, there are some customizations that Christy mentioned there that you can make at the client side. So, um, yeah, just be careful. Any changes that you make with the RDP properties will affect all of your session hosts and all of the users that are using those desktops. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, okay, so from Twitter, ooh, this one's fun too. Um, are ephemeral disks supported on AVD? Go ahead, Eric. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the usage of, <clears throat> excuse me, the usage of ephemeral disk would mean that we would support non-persistence in AVD, uh, and we don't support that today. So um, we're working on this solution and capability. Uh, this is in Citrix DAS and other uh, non-persistence is supported. Uh, what that means uh, basically is that uh, a lot of customers like to trigger based upon a schedule, whether it's when a user logs off or at the end of the night or at midnight or you know something, reverting all of their hosts to the gold image state. Um, so that's not something that we support. Um, our AVD hosts stay running until you do a host pool update um, on that. There's no way to force a trigger to revert. Uh, you can manually go in and uh, create new ones, but that's not exactly what customers are, are desiring or expecting when they when they have those ephemeral disks or true non-persistent support. So uh, the quick answer to the question is no, but I gave a little more verbose uh, kind of an understanding of what ephemeral disks mean overall. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good call because when we, when you create a host pool and provision session hosts, um, we we have the art the RD agent get installed. There's a lot of communication that happens between the session hosts and, and the broker, and so it really does assume a kind of a permanent connection, uh, be able to communicate with it. So yeah, it's uh, I feel like there's different kind of built-in assumptions that we have within ABD compared to the other you know, non-persistent uh, deployment options. So, um, was, did, uh, Ian, did you want to comment any more on that? No, I'm just reading the question that was coming through that I've seen, so. Yeah, so the new, so uh, this one's a, a larger question. So let me get, let me see if I can give it justice. Our typical AVD users have company devices, but we have a new user who needs to access AVD from their personal device. I'm concerned about security. I want to restrict the communication between their local computer and uh, our AVD instances. That way, even if their system is affected by any malware, that it won't affect um, our AVD, say, infrastructure. So no file sharing, no hardware sharing. Everything should be done within the AVD only. Mm -hmm. What is the best practice here? I'm happy to take a stab at it, um, and I'm, I'm sure Ian will probably jump in here a little bit. Um, so uh, security is definitely at the forefront of a lot of our customers' minds, and when you have a personal device joining, uh, there's, there's an, an inherent concern about that. Uh, I think things that you can do are uh, um, avoiding clipboard redirection. You can disable uh, device redirection. Um, just keep in mind that if you're... You, if you want that user to use things like Teams to participate in conference calls or to do other things that may require a, a camera or, or, a, um, or a microphone, those are things that they'll have to have in order to, for that to work. Uh, but if you just have like an information worker and all they're doing is using web pages, um, you have within the host pool properties to disable a lot of the, the redirection um, and you can you know, ensure that the, the communication is secure that way. That's absolutely right, Jason. I think the challenge that we have, and certainly raised by this question here, is it might be just one user. So because of the redirections, again, they're set at the host pool level. You know, if you turned off, say, I don't know, USB redirection or whatever it might be, it affects all the users. And this question highlights maybe just one person connecting in from home. And that's some feedback that we've taken from many, many of our customers. Um, and that feedback is certainly um, um, you know, being investigated. So uh, yeah, um, to watch your space on that one. Yeah, I think also um, maybe it's not necessarily directly connected to the 
device and threat vulnerability. But we were mentioning earlier, there's a question on screen cache protection, watermark, uh, watermarking. There's different ways that you can just uh, manage the sensitivity of your data. Um, so that way you can't screen capture um, and have that, you know, leak. But yeah, in terms of the just the device security um, and malware protection, yeah, just any of the device redirections. Um, the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint uh, supports uh, Windows 10.11 Enterprise um, along with Windows 10.11 Enterprise Multi-Session. Um, uh, at least I, if someone can confirm on that, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure, like 99% sure it supports multi-session. Um, but that's a great mm, tool. Does. Okay, perfect. Whew, okay. Uh, <laughs> that was a bold statement I made without uh, confirming. But um, yeah, definitely you can run those on your machines. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely have heard feedback, like Ian mentioned, of how can we just make sure that the connections are more conditional or how can we make it you know, even more flexible so that way if any malware is detected on the local device, we actually don't even allow the user to connect to their, um, you know, their, their, the session host. Um, and so we're definitely trying to get feedback and trying to make that, um, you know, see how we can support you because, uh, yeah, this is a solution for remote working. This is a solution for you to provide access to an environment that you control and manage, that you want to be secure. And so you want to make sure you have that barriers from external threats. So definitely taking it uh, really seriously. And we have folks that are working on it. All right. So we're uh, coming up to the end of the hour. Um, this has been a fun conversation. I've really enjoy <laughs> enjoyed this. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of great questions, too. Yeah. And so I guess I'll, I'll kind of go around, uh, around the horn here. Um, and I'll start with Eric and then Ian and Jason. Just final thoughts tips, um, things or features you want to make sure that, that folks are testing, provide feedback on? Um, Eric, I'll start with you. Yeah. My number one thing is currency. Um, so we publish the new things in Azure Virtual Desktop in our docs. There's a specific doc that we called What's New. Uh, and there's quite a few of them, actually. We have an overall AVD What's New doc. That's a great place. We have ones for um, sub ones in that what's new bucket for our agent and our insights and FS logics. Jason already talked about that. Uh, multimedia redirection, remote desktop clients. And also there's one around docs. So we do publish doc updates. Um, we don't always release, you know, new features, but our doc team is always iterating and improving our docs. And uh, that helps reduce blockers and just understanding how to deploy our product or how to use it. So I want to make a big call out to our what's new. Don't just stop at the AVD what's new one. Look at the other ones and also uh, the doc ones at the bottom. Focus on that one. Those are the best ways to stay current on the things that we're shipping in Azure Virtual Desktop. So that's, that's plug number one. Number two is book your calendars for Ignite. Nice. Ian? Yeah, thanks, Christian. Um, yeah, I think, you know, keep providing the feedback for the tech community. We we do use that, um, that feedback to help drive the, the future improvements on AVD. You know, specifically the two really good features that I've seen used massively across uh, enterprises that I'm working with include, you know, personal desktop scaling to drive the cost of your AVD deployment right down, but also custom image templates as well, being able to simplify and optimize the cadence in which you can refresh your host pools. It's such a massively powerful tool. It's built on Azure Image Builder. And uh, yeah, go ahead, test it and use it. We we see a lot of customer success with the uh, custom image templates. I guess it's my turn. I'm last. Yep. Um, yep, last words. <laughs> la last, last few thoughts in here is I just want to reiterate what Ian said that feedback is critical, right? We as a as an engineering team, we want to build products that matter to our customers, and the only way we know that is through direct customer feedback and really understanding what are the use cases. So providing that feedback is critical. Shameless plug for FS Logics. Um, I spent uh, and released in March. Uh, all brand new FS logics 
uh, documentation. So if you've not had a chance to go out there and look at that, uh, huge update, a lot of great new information, especially if you're unsure on, on how do I build this? How do I get started? Some great examples. Um, and then also follow us on the FS Logics blog where you can keep up to date on all the new releases that are happening, any things that are changing to the environment or things like that. I'm super active on social media. Um, on that blog via Reddit and LinkedIn. So, you know, look for me there. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for joining and listening. Um, so our first uh, Azure Virtual Desktop AMA um, for the Windows in the Cloud. Um, join us next month where we'll be going back to Windows 365 and any updates there. But thank you to our, our guests, and thank you all for joining. Um, and have a great morning, afternoon, evening. Goodbye. Awesome. See ya. Stay sunny.